All right, we'll go ahead and open in prayer and we'll jump right into the book of Acts. Guys, we seek to understand uh, your plan, your purpose better. It's uh, it's always a daunting task to to really take a step back and understand your word from uh, from the entire perspective, beginning to end. Yet we have to do so because we we, we misapply or misunderstand uh, messages within Scripture, uh, and we want to keep them exactly into the context which they are given. We pray that we do that so this evening, um, and, and also we 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 want to de and desire to continue to uh, represent who you are to a world in need properly, convincingly, with proper uh, grasp of the entire scriptures. To pray for those who cannot be with us, those who are ill in recovery, think of Roger, um, and make sure he feels better after the surgery, um, and be able to uh, regain all of his faculties soon so that he can rejoin us and, and, and the family as well. So thank you for uh, who you are as God that we have an eternity to look forward to. And this world is simply just passing. We praise you and thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. We are in Acts. We are exploring the book of Acts. Um, it's going to be interesting because, you know, eventually we'll get to areas of the, of the text which actually probably impact us more as far as our overall history of the, of the church as a whole. Yet we're still right now in the, in the thralls of understanding Peter his ministry specifically to Jerusalem and Judea. Remember, the book of Acts is a historical tome about the activity of the apostles and God as the message of Jesus Christ is spread from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. This is going to be Acts lesson number 23, Acts 3, 12 through 26, Peter's second proclamation, part four. There you go. Acts 3, 19 through 26, and this one's going to be titled The Promise. Trying to kind of an uh, encapsulation of the idea of what's being taught in Acts 3, 19 to 26. Um, I felt that the promise was the best concept or idea that is mentioned, even though the word promise is not used, however, the covenant is. I remember the book of Acts captures the events of the apostles as Peter and Paul spread the word of Jesus Christ. Acts is a book of transition, meaning that there's a lot going on that that do not apply to us today because it happened back then. I call it the apostolic era in which God is uh, with his chosen people, not only the apostles, but other individuals were given certain abilities to have as credentials so that they, when they spoke for God, it would carry a level of authority with it because they did acts of a supernatural nature. The administration of the church begins, and I would say it actually began at the cross. I actually talked with Eric about this again, um, and he doesn't have a problem with it, but it's it's a little bit nuanced. People that have never really said that before, and I said the only reason I say it is because of Ephesians 2. When did the dividing wall get broken down? It's at the cross. I can't really pinpoint a different time in which Scripture dictates clearly when the church begins other than when that dividing wall got broken down. It's not understood, in fact, I don't think it's understood for nearly 15, 20 years after Christ's resurrection and ascension. Um, Paul may have disclosed it, but there's, they're still struggling against it. We probably don't have a good coherency about the church until we're getting into AD 60. And then people start really realizing, yes, Gentiles and Jews, if they're believers, are part of this new administration. And the new administration will carry forward as Israel is being set aside. Paul doesn't say those words that Israel is set aside. And that the church is the pillar of truth until after AD 60. That's that's difficult for us to understand. How much did he know in time? Did he know that in his first missionary journey? Was he aware of it? Uh, did he know that Israel was being set aside at that time? Ah, it's, it's hard to say. But we have to understand that these things are being revealed slowly. And these are imperfect men with imperfect minds. And the information they received from the Holy Spirit is not only completely understood at the time it was given. The, the, the Acts concerns the church, but it's not about the church. Later on, it gets, it gets revealed, and we have some information that we can go ahead and say it's about the church, but the Acts as a whole concerns it, but not about it. As we go forward into Acts, we always have to remember that we must not build doctrine from the book of Acts unless we can substantiate it in the epistles. There's a good question about that coming up in Acts 15, 
where James writes a letter to the Gentile believers concerning things that it said it was good for the to them and the spirit to give upon them no other requirements except for these three things. And there we'll go over those three things. And there's a question. Is that substantiated in the epistles? Is this something that we should pay attention to as well? And we'll talk about what gets there. But those are the kind of questions that we have to continue to ask as we move forward in the book of Acts. As I said before at the very beginning, that we have to understand that the early parts of Acts is not about the church. Why do I say that on a regular basis? Because people will read passages like what we're going to read tonight and go, this is something that we also is commanded for us. And even though it is fascinating to understand God's plan and purpose, this is not concerning the church. It's concerning Israel. Let's go ahead and pick up and uh, read Acts 3, 12 through 19. We'll make a quick review, and then we'll move on to the rest of the passage, 3, 19 through 26. I believe we'll be able to get through the rest of the chapter tonight and then pick up in chapter 4 next week. But I really make sure we're all on the same page. Verse 12. But when Peter saw this, he re replied to the people, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. But put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are all our witnesses. And on the basis of faith in his name, that is the name of Jesus, which has strengthened this man, whom you see and know, the faith which comes through him has given him the perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance, just as your rulers did also, but the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, and, and he, he has thus fulfilled. Therefore, reconsider and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So in this passage, Peter challenges the Jews in Jerusalem to reconsider their understanding of God. He begins first by deflecting. Sorry, they're like, oh, what? I'm missing a slide here. Yes, I am missing a slide. Peter begins by deflecting the attention the awe from himself to Jesus Christ and states clearly that the Jews in Jerusalem are held responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus. But that Jesus is alive, being resurrected, and it is the name of Jesus, the ability or the fame of Jesus. Remember, it's it's not calling upon it as some type of incantation. In the name of Jesus, I, I heal you. It is simply for the fame of Jesus and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, which they were granted in order to be able to give that calling card to challenge the people and what they understood with the credentials of them being able to heal. So Peter challenges the Jews afterwards in Jerusalem to reconsider their understanding of God. That's the word metaneo, metanoia, which is translated repent. You know how I feel about that word. Horrible translation. I wish they would change it. They're going to reconsider the, their understanding of God in his nature, his plan, and the identity of Jesus. So who is Jesus <clears throat> primarily is the ultimate question. But also you, they have to, they're being challenged in the question of who is God. What's his nature like? What's his plan and his purpose? They have gone into and being consumed by the law. As Paul uh, states clearly in the book of Romans, the Jews were under the misunderstanding mis, uh, brought about by the pharisaical unit that if we keep the law, then we will be okay with God. And that's not true. Something that still goes today. In fact, it's not wrong to call many of the leaders of various different Christendom sects I don't like to call them Christians, pharisaical, because they are still promoting the same idea that the Pharisees are promoting, that it's by your works, by your efforts, by your keeping of law, that you are made right with God. And it's only made, made right through God, to God, by grace through faith. If they understood, if they changed their mind, if they returned to God, then there would come about this time of refreshing. We went over this briefly, and we're going to go over it a little bit more, but I want to make sure we understand this a little bit before we actually get into the, to the text of the promise, is that this time of refreshing is a 
phrase that indicates the messianic reign. We'll go over why that is in just a moment. Um, but before we do that, we have to remember that this is historical. This is the call to return to the Lord so the time of refreshing may come. The reason why I mention this is because people believe that we are now currently in the time of refreshing because they believe that Jesus Christ is reigning. It is the time of refreshing. They don't, they're either amillennial or premillennial. They don't believe in a literal return of Jesus Christ. So therefore they have to claim that right now we're in the time of refreshing. They claim a lot of spiritual concepts, not different ideas. And it's not, that has not come. It did not come. It's historical, a proclamation, an offer, but it did not come. We know that, the, that Israel did not return. And the Lord did not send back Jesus. It is not a spiritual concept. It is a literal physical concept. He will return at the end of the tribulation, but the offer remains. This is one of the areas which, again, I disagree with many of my contemporaries in which they said that the offer has been withdrawn. I don't think the offer is withdrawn. I think Israel is in a perpetual state of rejection. Um, it has the same ends, so that it all ends up at the same spot, but the offer remains to Israel. If they would return to God, the time of refreshing would come. They won't. We know when that will happen. They will return at the end of the tribulation, but the offer remains nonetheless. This brings us again to Acts 3, 19 to 26, titled The Promise. I do want to go back to 3.19 because it's all connected. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order of that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus, the Christ, appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things uh, about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, to whom, to him, you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it shall be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announce these days. It is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your father, saying to Abraham, and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. All right. So verses 19 to 21 all refer to the same promise, focusing on a different aspect. The first one is this kind of idea of the time of refreshing. Now, the word refreshing is a hot pox legomena. I like saying that word because I can say it clearly and I say it with energy. It means it's a word that's only used once in the New Testament. Um, it's not a difficult word in the, in the concept of what it means, but it is kind of an interesting thing because people try to tie this back to the Old Testament and the word is not used this way. So the word itself has a concept. What's the concept? Well, it's a time of rest, a time of relief. Israel has been, from the point of Babylon forward, always under oppression. Uh, we call it the time of the Gentiles. We call it the time of, of uh, basically the uh, uh, where there's no king in Israel. Remember, for there to be at peace, they have to have a king. That king, there's no king. There's no real borders. They're always under the thumb. They're, they're currently who's in charge. It's not the Jews. They have a mock uh, a king called Herod who is not even a Jew, who they who calls himself a Jew, but really who's in charge is Rome. And they've always had a Gentile presence from the time of Babylon forward. They've never been free. They've never had a time of rest. They've always been under battle and war, under constant oppression. But there's a promise made in Zephaniah, Zephaniah chapter 3. We don't read enough of Zephaniah to understand the promises that God made to Israel. And here's what he says, shout for joy, O daughter of Zion, shout in triumph, O Israel, rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away his judgments against you. When God takes away his judgments, what's he referring to? Now, this is post-exile prophecy, but they're still under oppression. So what does he mean? He's taking away the, the, the judgments against them. Well, that means no oppression, 
no miscarriages, all your crops will grow bountiful. And right up at this point, they're not, which means we're talking eschatology. We're talking about the end. The Lord has taken away his judgments against you. He's cleared away your enemies. The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. Has that ever happened in Israel? No. Still talking about future events. In that day, it will be said to Jerusalem, do not be afraid, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. When Jesus came the first time, you can say that the Lord is in the midst. Is he a victorious warrior? No, he is the suffering servant. Two different aspects. He will exult over you with joy. He will quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. I will gather those who grieve about the appointed feasts. They came for, from you, O Zion. The reproach of exile is a burden on them. Behold, I am going to deal at that time with your oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcasts. I will turn their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in, even at the time when I gather you together. Indeed, I will give you renown and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. So here we have a prophecy from Zephaniah dealing with a time of what? A time where Israel would be completely at shalom, at peace at rest, refreshed. It's not yet, and this is the promise. So in other words, Jesus Christ came already. He died on the cross as given up by the, the ones being held responsible, the Jews. He rose again from the dead and ascended, and he's waiting for what? For them to call upon his name. When he calls upon the name, then this time will come. So do you see why I've emphasized the fact that this is not going to be for us? I'm going to say this now. I'll say it again. I have it in my notes for later on, but I'm going to say it again right now. It's very important. If all the world believed in Jesus and called upon him to save us from the predicament of this world, it will not come until Israel does it. Israel is the key. They won't until the end of the tribulation. But it does not matter what the Gentile nations do. It doesn't matter what the church does. We're waiting until those until we're called out of here. The tribulation will start. Then at the end, the remnant, the Israel, will go ahead and call upon the Lord. Then he will come down and restore all things. And this time of refreshing would then come about. The next verse talks about Jesus, the Messiah, appointed for you. He will send Jesus. Um, obviously, we, were, we know what this is talking about. This is second coming language. This is not rapture. Stop it. Okay, it's not about us. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about Israel. I know, I'm harping on it. Hopefully you all get it by now. But for those who don't, it's not about us. It's not about the church. It's not about believers, Gentile nations. It's about Israel. This is about the second coming. The word appointed, uh, uh, prox harizo, is a word that is a, it's a compound word, very interestingly enough. The word pra means to, to basically before the face. Okay, it's like here. Okay. The word hair there, the hair the, right there, is a word that basically means hand. So appointed means to be grabbed by the hand and brought to you. So that's why the idea of chosen appointed is maybe a little bit less of a clear word for it, but basically it's a, it's a chosen word. He's chosen or selected. How this word is used in classical Greek and in, in, in Koine Greek is very interesting because what the word implies throughout all the meanings, because it's not used a whole lot scripturally, is to be ready on hand and easily access, available for use. In other words, you have it, it's here, and I have it ready with me. Let's talk about weapons a lot of times or different tools based upon the need of the situation, farmers or, or, or soldiers. 
Uh, this word is also used of Paul when he's being appointed for the Gentiles. He goes and he's always ready. He's, this is his job. It's the only thing he's ever uh, that he's appointed to do is to go to the Gentiles and preach to the Gentiles the gospel. So he's appointed. He has this. He's selected and he's always ready and on hand and accessible to the Gentiles for this purpose. Jesus, therefore, is chosen, selected of the Father. People have trouble with that kind of language because obviously he is part of the triunity and God himself. But remember, we're talking about Jesus in his humanity being sent, being somewhere is a, is a human trait, not a divine trait. So the fact that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, it's in his humanity right now that he is not here with us and he's in heaven, waiting in heaven, is a hu human trait, not a divine one. So when we talk about things like this, it's talk about from the, his humanity, not his divinity. So he, Jesus, is ready at any time to return at the Father's will. When will the Father will it? When Israel returns to the Lord. Okay? So once again, verse 19, it's about the Messianic reign. Verse 20, Jesus returns, second coming. Verse 21, period of restoration. Period of restoration. The word restoration, apokatastasis, uh, right here, that's the noun form of the verb apokatastami, which basically means to restore. So restoration to restore. We've seen this word before. It's the exact same word we find in Acts chapter 1, verse 6. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? What? So three verses, all in kind of sequence, understanding this concept is very easy. And it's not about our, it's not about the rapture. It's not about our glorification. It is talking about Israel's restoration into that kingdom. In verse 21, also, it says, whom heaven must receive. Heaven must receive him until the final days commence. The language here is very interesting because the word must is there. Sometimes within uh, the, the text itself, they will add certain ideas to help with the English flow. But the word must is there. Um, so the word uh, indicates that there is a purpose and a plan and that the ascension is an integral part of God's plan in reference to eschatology. So then and now is an interim period between two major points in prophecy. Jesus is coming, death, resurrection, ascension, that is, that's a must, okay? And then they're waiting for it, the restoration to occur. We, we talked about the Israeli eschatology, talking about the, the eschatology from the Hebrew perspective. And this is the biggest part of it. They do not know how long this interim period is. They suspect it is within seven years. Seven, obviously they have to wait for the tribulational period to, to begin. They don't anticipate being pulled out before the before the tribulational period begins. Why would they assume that? Why would they assume that they will be raptured out before the day of wrath? They don't, they, they don't assume that. They, they assume that they will enter into it. That is why Peter is preparing them for the tribulational period. He is anticipating, based upon what he knows, what has been revealed to him, based upon all of his knowledge from the Old Testament, based upon what Jesus Christ was telling him, even in Matthew 24 and 25, those types of areas, that they will go through the tribulational period and be part of that remnant who will enter into the kingdom as humans. That's what they anticipate. Now, before Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, in the Gospels, there is no indication of this interim period being enhanced. There's, there's, 
There's no language in the Gospels that would talk about this interim period. So we look at this and say, oh, you know, they they'd already knew this. Mm, I think we can go back and look into some of the Old Testament prophecies now and understand that there the interim period was talked about. But there's no indication they understood it. Jesus didn't talk in, in, in aspects of an interim period. But now it is understood. In fact, when when would they have understood it? Well, it, it's hard to say because it doesn't really discuss it. Obviously, in, in verse 3, he talks about in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, there was a period of over 40 days speaking of the things concerning the kingdom. Jesus was appearing to the disciples, to the apostles on a regular basis for over a month, talking about things of the kingdom. It was probably here in which she talked possibly about an interim period. However, they still ask the question, is it now? So maybe not. So when would Peter begin to understand this interim period? Holy Spirit maybe taught him all things, gave him more information, more revelation. But he doesn't understand everything. It's because he doesn't understand everything that we have to make sure that we understand that this interim, he must go into heaven and be received there until the end times were commencing, that that is being, un that's, that's understood, but we cannot say that Peter's a pro proclaiming a new administration. Going back to Matthew chapter 16, where the, the major um, understanding is that where, where Jesus tells Peter that upon the rock, this rock, I will build my church. Right? We talked about that. It's not talking about the, 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 the now time, our time, the administration of the new man. He was talking about the remnant. So Peter is building what? The ecclesia, the remnant. He has no clue that what he is actually establishing or has implications of establishing is the church. Okay. So the new administration is not revealed until Paul. And even then, it's fought against. Peter's not building us. He is building the remnant. And upon his words, even during the tribulational period, Peter's words will become reinstituted in order to facilitate the, the, uh, the remnant at that time. So once again, must indicates that the ascension is an integral part of God's plan in reference to eschatology. Not our eschatology, their eschatology. Do we also have implications based upon the ascension for us? Yes. Primarily that we will are not called for wrath. We're, we will be pulled out of here prior to the wrath, but Israel will obviously go through it. All right. I... I, I know this is a little bit of a, a rehash of, of things we've talked about in various different lessons, not only in Matthew, but also when we talked about eschatology and various things on Sunday in our, in our doctrinal studies. But we really got to make sure we have our head on straight when we read this. Otherwise, if we think, hey, this is Acts, this is post-resurrection, this is post-Holy uh, Spirit coming, we start putting these things to ourselves and we come up with bad, uh, bad, um, doctrinal lessons or bad prescriptions for the church, thinking that we're the ones who's going to cause Jesus to return, or we're going to be the, the uh, instrumental part of that. In this section, we have the promise. What is the promise? Well, the promise is the restored messianic kingdom, as stated at various different times. Um, it's foretold by the prophets. This promise is not, it can't be obviously the church because the prophets had no clue about the church. The restored messianic kingdom foretold by the prophets. The prophets are Moses, Samuel, and onward. Now there are there other prophets beforehand that may have talked about this. Maybe. Um, I, you, I, you look at Baal, I think may, um, uh, uh, Balaam, sorry, Balaam may have had some in, uh, other implications. Also going all the way back to um, Abel. Because Abel was a prophet, talked about it in, in Hebrews chapter 11. But he, here, 
Peter is going to emphasize Moses, Samuel, and onward. He only quotes Mount Moses, um, but he obviously is referring back to information that we are not all familiar with or comfortable with, uh, but Moses is a big one. So in Acts chapter 3, verses 22 to 23, he says this primarily. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, to whom you sh to him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not heed the prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. So here we have this reference to the prophet. Now, I imagine that Peter and the uh, other apostles, specifically John here, were talking with the people on a regular basis, talking about these prophecies in great detail. What is captured by the author here, Luke, we presume, as only gives us information that we need to be able to understand the old plan and purpose and point of what she's talking about. So here we have the prophecies of the prophet. And if you don't understand the prophecies of the prophet, then you're going to read through the book of John and be very confused. Because in John chapter 1, the Pharisees come and talk to John the baptizer. This is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, I am not the Christ. They asked him, who are you then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Well, he was a prophet, but he is he the prophet. Big distinction. Articles matter. Then they said to him, who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am a voice of the one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. As Isaiah the prophet said, now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him and said, why then are you baptizing if you're not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? You read that and go, I don't understand. Because if you don't understand the prophecies of the prophet, this is not going to make sense. In fact, later on in John chapter 6, it mentions the prophet again. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. What are they referring to? I'm supposed to have 740 there. Oh, I missed another one. Mm, my goodness, I'm all over the place. So the Jews were confused as to the identity of the Messiah. Why do I say that? Well, in the question, what do they ask him? Are you the Messiah? No. Are you the prophet? If you understand the prophecies, you would understand that the Messiah is the prophet. But they didn't get that. In fact, they began to give various prophecies persona. They would look at the scriptures and go, the, the, the Messiah seems to have various different functions. So maybe there are more than one Messiahs. This was, this was a prominent way of thinking during the time of Christ. In fact, I, just the, these are three. There's several others, actually, of different rabbinic teachings about various different messianic persona. There's Messiah ben Joseph, Messiah ben Moses, Messiah ben David. Those are the three most prominent ones that you'll find. Messiah ben Joseph is often referred to as the suffering servant. He's the one who suffers, who is disowned by his family, goes into various different trials and difficulties. He has a hard life. So they call him Messiah ben Joseph, because take it after Joseph, the son of Jacob. Then there's Messiah ben Moses, who is often referred to as the one like Moses. This is where we get the idea of the prophet. This is the, this is the prophecy of the prophet. He's going to be like Moses. He's going to do miraculous things. He's going to do great, awesome miracles and all kinds of different ideas. Lead the people. Then there's Messiah ben David, which refers to, like we do in Zephaniah, as the victorious warrior. They don't look at this these prophecies as one individual. They were looking at him as three, maybe four or five different individuals, various different anointed ones. So when they ask him, are you the, the prophet? What are they asking? They're asking, are you the one that was supposed to come in likeness of Moses? 
So Messiah ben, Messiah ben Moses is known as the prophet. Where do these prophecies come from? It's, pro, it's primarily one, and that's Deuteronomy chapter 18. Go over there, look at verses 13 through the rest of the chapter. Moses begins kind of a, a, remember, Deuteronomy is second law, the second giving, or basically reiteration of the law. Exodus, Numbers, and Leviticus are all kind of recaptured and restated in the book of Deuteronomy, and then he gives them additional charges near the end of his life. Deuteronomy 18, for you shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For those nations which, shall, which you shall dispose, listen to those who practice witchcraft and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do so. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. When they talk about the Messiah in the Gospels to Jesus, what do they say about him? Number one, we don't know where he's going to come from. Number two, um, he's going to come from the clouds, right? Meaning they're referring to which Messiah? The final conquering king, the Messiah ben David. But if they're paying attention to the Messiah ben Moses, the prophet, he will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. What does that mean? He will be born into Israel. And he'll be a prophet, the prophet. This is according to all that you've asked the Lord, your God in Herob, on the day of assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord, my God. Let me not see the great fire anymore. I will die. Remember back in Exodus, they heard the voice of the Lord when he spoke the ten, the Decalogue. And they go, we can't do this anymore. You go speak to him for us and come tell us what we have to say, because if we're going to continue to listen to this, we're going to die. And Moses said, fine. And God said, fine. For now on, I will only speak to prophets. Very few times did God ever speak himself again to anybody. He spoke through prophets from that point forward. And so therefore, the prophecy is, I will send the prophet to you. The Lord said to me, they have spoken well. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I commanded him. I shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words when he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. In other words, um, he's going to be cut off. I'm going to require his life. Now, this is not reconciliation. This is not going to heaven or avoiding hell. This is about being cut off from the land of Israel. So when Peter reiterates this, that if you don't heed the, the, the voice of the prophet, you're going to be cut off from amongst your people. You're not going to be part of that remnant. This is all about the remnant. It's not about reconciliation, this passage. It doesn't even talk about that here. It talks about how to get involved in, in passing through this eschatological period. Later on, the death of Moses is recorded. Obviously, it's still written in Deuteronomy. And it's suspected about who might have wrote, might have written this. Uh, I suspect that it was probably started to be penned by, um, by, by, um, not Joseph, Joseph, uh, Joshua. Joshua, thank you. I always do that. <clears throat> Get those two confused all the time. But it may have also been added by Ezra later on during the time of the post-exile, post because this is what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 34. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he, God, buried him in the valley of the land of Moab, opposite Beth Baor. But no man knows what his burial place is to this day. Jude gives us a little interesting little tidbit later on about that. Although Moses was 120 years old when he died, his eyes were not dim, nor his vigor abated. So the sons of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the days of weeping and mourning of Moses came to an end. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands on him, and the sons of Israel listened to him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. Since that time, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses. That statement by itself, what does it mean? 
Yeah. At, at the time of the the con the the, the, con the consolidation of Deuteronomy, again, I believe under Ezra, uh, during the time when it was all put together. We'll talk about that during the conference, by the way, the bibliology uh, intensive on back to back Sundays. That they're still waiting. At the time of Ezra, he realizes there's no one else like Moses yet. We're still waiting for him. Whom the Lord knew face to face. For all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent to him by the performance of the land of Egypt against Pharaoh, and all his servants, and all of his land, and all the mighty power, and for all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of Israel. They're still waiting. Now that's in spite of Elijah and Elisha doing many miraculous things as well. So it's not they were just looking for somebody who did miracles because they had Elijah and Elisha, but no one's been like Moses. They're still waiting. So after Moses is Samuel. Now Samuel is the primary quarter of biblical material in Judges' roots at the end of 1 Samuel, um, where he dies. And then 2 Samuel... And first and second kings are written within the same thing. We think maybe is Nathaniel or Gad, one of these prophets. Now, I didn't even mention Gad. I should have mentioned Gad in here, but I did not. But the primary uh, prophets from the time of Samuel forward, Nathan, Shemaiah, Hananiah, Ahijah, Yehu, Micaiah, Elijah, Elisha, Obadiah, Joel, Amos, Hosea, Jonah, Isaiah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Daniel, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. I did forget one because I already mentioned him as Gad, which he didn't have anything writing and basically speaks very few words in the uh, in, in the book of Second uh, First and Second Kings. And there were more. These are the ones that we know information about. There was a school of the prophets that Elijah and Eli that Elijah was actually in, in charge of, who basically gave proclamation to the Lord. I don't know how that worked. I don't know how it was done. But during the time of Elijah, all of them were killed. So there was a good number of other prophets that is not mentioned within Scripture. These are the ones mentioned primarily in Scripture. Every single one of them, I believe, especially those who are in written form, because there are some that are not, okay? They, 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 primarily these, these first uh, seven don't have anything written by them. All we have is, unless we talk about maybe perhaps for, uh, first and second, uh, second Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings, all the other ones, every single one of them, have prophecies concerning the Christ in some aspect. Now, it's not always every single word about Jesus, but there is going to be information contained in Jonah, Isaiah, Micah, Daniel, Haggai, Zechariah. Zephaniah, Malachi, all these individuals in some form or another talk about the times of refreshing. Talk about the end times of the Messiah. So it could be their life, the death, resurrection, ascension, return, rule. All of them have those aspects. But every single one of them point to the final promise. Which, it's again, it, it draws into attention a question you have to ask. What is all of this really about? All of this recorded history, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, all the way forward to Malachi, the Gospels, Acts, Revelation. What's it really containing? What's it really about? It's about the promise in Genesis 3.15, that God will fix it. Now, he chooses to work through a particular nation. And so when it talks about the restoration of Israel, what does that also include? What does it say here in Acts? The restoration of what? In verse 21. All things. So remember, let's well, turn here. I don't have it in my I don't have it in my notes, but let's turn over to Ro Romans chapter 11 real quick. I just want to show you this real quick. Romans chapter 11.
Look at verse 13. Uh, we'll start at verse 11. Start at verse 11. I say then, they, that is Israel, did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. So the, the offer of salvation, the, the, the gospel itself, the administration of the gospel has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? But I am speaking to you who are Gentiles inasmuch as I am uh, as an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move jealousy, my fellow countrymen, and save some of them. For if their rejection is reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? When they accept Jesus, when Israel, the remnant, the, the nation itself, accepts Jesus, and Jesus comes back, what will that mean for the rest of the world? This is glory. This is the glory that is promised to us that we see in the rest of Scripture. That's what we're looking forward to. How does that get there? Israel. So, yes, it, if we're involved in this. Yes, we're beneficiaries of it. Yes, we're going to be here and be part of it. But it's the, these promises made in Acts are about Israel. So Peter then concludes the point by directing them to their calling. What is their calling in chapter 3? You are the sons of the prophets. You are the ones that have the covenants. You are the ones who have the promise has been made, and you're the ones who are supposed to be the beneficiaries of this. But you have to be believers. You cannot be a disbeliever and, and go, you know what, but I'm a Jew. I'm good to go. That's no. Remember, according to Romans chapters 2 and 3, very clearly God is not one who part, plays partiality. If they don't believe in Jesus, they don't believe in God, they don't get in. The admonition and charge can only be applied to the Jews. The passage cannot be applied to the church. We're not, we're not sons of the covenant. We're not sons of the fathers. As much as we want to say, I am a child of Abraham. Yes, by faith, one, one aspect of it. But you are not a child of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are not that. Unless you're a Jew, then you can be that too. But for the most part... Here, Gentiles, we're not part of this promise. We're not part of this encouragement. There are things that we can take away from it, that we should not dismiss God, that we should always maintain a belief in God. But we do not take on the promises which are made to the, to the Jews. Once again, he says, for you first, Jesus is the Messiah of the world, but the Jews are the primary recipients of this message, and the Jews will be the light of the world. As I stated before, I'll say it again now. If the whole world believed in Jesus and yet Israel did not, the restoration would not take place. We're waiting for them. Now, again, we know when that will be. We don't have to worry about it. But that's what we're waiting for. I wanted to redirect you also to something that Peter said in 1 Peter. Since we're talking about Peter and his message, and he, he writes a letter to Jewish believers when did that happen? I don't know exactly, but what, when I get to the area where I think he might have written this letter, we'll do an overview of First, of first Peter. Uh, but First Peter says in chapter 2, Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord, and coming to him as to uh, coming as to a living, a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value, then, is for those who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, they became the very this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient. That word disobedient is unbelieving, off the stuo, to the word, 
and to this doom they were also appointed. But you, who's the you? Jewish believers, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. It's not about the church. People misapply this to the church all the time. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the, you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. By the way, this portion here, people are like, oh, that's us. No, that's from Hosea. Still about Israel. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers, the diaspora Jews, to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing which they slander you as evildoers, they may, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. When would the, how would the Gentiles, who are enemies of God, glorify God in the day of visitation? That is the second coming. Only if they are what? Believers. How do they become believers? Through the testimony of the diaspora Jews. This was the whole idea behind the, the, the early apostles was to witness to diaspora Jews to take back to their own people who spoke that language, spoke those people, influenced the Jews there, and then spread that to the Gentiles. I am convinced that the, when, when Peter and the apostles first set out, that they believed that's what their mission was. Go out to the diaspora Jews, save them. Talk to them about the Messiah so that the Jews may become this, that royal priesthood, that light unto the world. Here in 1 Peter chapter 2, God called out a nation to be his unique people. The promise was consummated with the appearing and sacrifice of the Messiah. The complete fulfillment of those promises are yet to come but are assured. And so looking forward in, 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 in 1 Peter to those commandments, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 through the rest of the book, this is the basis for living godly amongst the Gentiles so that they can be a good behavioral witness teaching them about Jesus Christ. Don't do anything like them because they're not going to respect you if you just act like them all the time. So back in Acts, what does Peter tell them? God is now calling upon them to turn from their wicked ways. Now, he's talking to Jews in Jerusalem, devout Jews. Jews are going to the temple. What are their wicked ways? It's not like they're talking to diaspora Jews who sometimes get influenced and fall into paganism even. What's their wicked ways? Well, the word wicked is used interestingly in Matthew chapter 22, where it says, then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, teacher, we know that you're truthful and teach the way of God and truth and defer to no one for you are not partial to any. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus pre perceived there that word malice is wickedness. Said, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Same thing idea in Luke chapter 11. Now, when he had spoken, a Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him. And he went in and reclined at the table. When the Pharisee saw it, he was surprised. He had not for ceremonially washed before the meal. But the Lord said to him, now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but inside you were full of robbery and wickedness. Can you imagine saying this to somebody who had you over for lunch? You foolish ones, did you not did did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give that which is within you as, as but so, but give that which is within as charity, and then all things are clean for you. But woe to you Pharisees, for you pay tithe of mint. And ruin every kind of garden herb, and yet disregard justice and the love of God. But these are things which you should have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the chief seats in the synagogues and the respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like concealed tombs, and the people who walk over them are unaware of it. Their wickedness is in their deceit in regards to the law and justice and mercy. Specifically, 
their wickedness in Matthew refers to them disowning the Holy One. So wickedness in this context is opposing the truth of God for a lie. Because of their selfish ambition, because of their want for power, they were full of selfish ambition and at the cost of disowning the Messiah to godless men. When he says to turn from your wickedness means you need to make right what you did to the Messiah. It's not necessarily moral, although it could be part of it, but it's definitely about how they disown God. Not believing him, not believing Jesus. They need to reconsider who Jesus is. Same ideas. Reconsider and return so that the time of refreshing may come. In chapter 4, we're going to read the result of this. Real quick, though, what does it say? Verse 4, many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Wow. Truly an amazing message. Let's pray. God in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can analyze this, see what it says, understand the plan from the beginning to end, know how that it applies to us and to what we should learn from it at the same time. Praise you for always uh, being a, a handout to Israel. Although they have rejected you, your patience, your love, and your mercy extends perpetually. Not because of who they are, not because of who we are, but because of your promises. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.